Hello and welcome to another episode of On the Floor with Wayne and Rob. I'm Wayne Highlander, National Sales Manager for Bone Adhesives. I'm Rob Johnson from Bona Training. How we doing, Rob? Pretty good, buddy. How's it going? Good. Uh, we we have a special guest with us today, and uh, I've actually known th- this gentleman for, for quite a while now, and um, um, I'll let him introduce himself, but I just want to say first that, uh, uh, you know, he's an inspector, NWFA inspector, and uh, he works for a distributor, but he was a contractor for a long time. He and I worked in the same, same area for a while, for many, many years, actually, and um, uh, you know, he's just got such a great reputation, his craftsmanship, his work, and just a solid guy. And, you know, when you're going to have an inspector in this industry, this you you, you want a guy like Carl Mattingly, our guest. How are we doing, Carl? I'm good, thank you. And thanks for those those kind words. I often, you know, we don't hear that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as an inspector, you know. Well, when Wait, you... is this a guy that, like, you let his tire, or the air out of his tires and yeah that's, and that, stuff like that I, yeah it's all in the past did you guys get all <laughs> yeah, that yeah. out you, you guys good now we don't want to talk about that yeah yeah no i'm kidding um but what carl wants you introduce yourself a little bit about you but your background okay um background is um you'd mentioned that rob's been in it uh, five generations i actually started in the flooring business uh, almost by accident uh with the flooring company during the summer in high school um Tried college for about six months, didn't like it, called the guy up, got back into the flooring business, um, been in it since. Uh, I've got my California license in uh, 1976 and uh, certified with NWFA in 2009. Um, Pretty much have been independent inspector since that time. And um, um, even prior to becoming a the inspector, I was always called out. You probably recognize this too as a contractor. Anyone looking for advice, they will always reach out to somebody that they know. So being in the area that I'm in, I've been in it for so long, my name is is somewhat recognized. And so I was actually doing some consulting and inspection before getting that certification in 2009. So, so. What, what drove you to become a, a certified inspector? Um, some of it was my years in the business and it was a conversation with my father-in-law actually. And, uh, he asked me what I, you know, if I was still doing it. So that was, uh, in 2009, he said, you know, you've, you've had a great run in the sand and finish part of the business. And he said, are you thinking about maybe hanging up the tools and moving in another direction? It literally was that ease of a conversation during a golf outing. We were sitting in a golf cart. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to call and check on that. The next day I called um, uh, NWFA and they said, we have a class in a couple of months. Send us your uh, your experience. And I signed up for it and went to the class and that was it. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was it was that easy. How long is that class now? Uh, it started on a Monday. It very pretty intense training and you you do your final test on uh, on the Friday. After that, you have three scenarios that they set up as far as what would be a sample inspection. You have to read those and write that report. Those are then graded by three of your peers. You have to pass two of those. Then once you pass those two tests, you then have to go out into the public and do two independent uh, inspection reports, turn those in, and those are reviewed by three individuals, and you have to have at least passing by two and then once that happens then you get certification so i was pretty aggressive on that uh so i i tested in august um they immediate when they sent the test back after i did and the mock-up tests i passed those and then i don't know how the word got out but in a short period of time i started getting phone calls even though i hadn't been certified um i got a couple of phone calls and was able to get out and do some inspections serious inspections and i turn them in and so within six months i had the certificate i had the certification in 2009 december so you know i i've said before carl that um you know i went to the same class and Mm -hmm. uh not not when you went but i went to the same uh, class to be an inspector and i i didn't go there to be an inspector i just went there for my own knowledge at that time i i was i was a rep and i just wanted to know you know as much as i could to help one of my clients or customers if they you know whatever Mm-hmm. But I came away thinking that everybody in this industry should attend that class, whether you want to be an inspector or not. 
and it, and I've gone to all the classes the NWFA offers, and and they're all great classes. But I don't know, man. That might have been the best class I ever took. Well, you know what? I think what it does, it kind of solidifies everything that anyone experiences in the business. And when I was in that class, there were probably, I think there were about maybe 25 people in the class. And I think I met five or six that were there truly for the experience and the knowledge. Some of them didn't take the test at the end of the week. Um, they probably could have, but that wasn't their purpose for being there. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, I met a good group of guys there and they were all interested in the same thing and that's how to improve. Um, I think the what we want to do on this show, Carl, is uh, we want to just, with your experience as, as an inspector and what you see and what causes most guys problems on jobs and, and, and uh, reasons for, for inspections or claims, and try to keep them out of trouble. That's just right. giving some, some advice to, or some tips that, you know, that kind of keep them from, from getting sideways and having to go down this road. So maybe we can kind of talk about what you see the most in, in your uh, experience. You know, I was reading through your notes, Carl, and I noticed the first thing you said or had in your notes was own a moisture meter and know how to use it. Yeah. I yeah. think that's a great place to start for everybody because um, like Wayne said, I do a lot of the training on the East and uh, I'm still pretty surprised how many guys don't use moisture meters or some of them you know they don't even have them so why don't we start there okay um well the reason i brought that up is that happens so often because generally if you're going to look at a hardwood job and you can recognize that it's not maybe an installation related issue from a you know surface damage or things like that if it's cupping or if it's some shrinkage you pretty much know you're going to be having to talk about site conditions, humidity, moisture levels of the wood. So that's that's pretty much one of the first questions that pops up as you're trying to get a little history going, you know, on those job sites. And I'm always maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but it's it is still surprising, as you said, Rob, how often um, they don't own one or they say I, I have access to one, you know, those kind of things. Um, I, and generally what happens if I finish a, an inspection and once I talk with them about that, it's surprising that the next conversation is, well, what kind of meter do you recommend? So it really is a, it's a, it's a pretty positive conversation because you find out they don't have one, talk to them the importance of having one. Next thing you know, they own one. Um, but generally speaking, when you start looking at a cup floor, you're on the East coast, I'm, I'm on the West coast. So we have fairly, uh, mild climates compared to what you know what you deal with back there i have a brother in michigan grand rapids uh he's in the flooring business he deals with probably the same conditions low humidity you know freezing conditions those kind of things so everyone i think in california has have people have a tendency to think that we don't need that or it's not that important um i find it highly important probably one of the most critical bit of information if we're going to look at a floor that has anything to do with moisture or lack of. I'm glad you said that because at all my trainings, that's uh, I always give all the guys on the east a pat on the back. I said, you want to test finish? You want to test test it out east, just like where your brother lives in Michigan. I mean, the swings that we go through out here between, you know, the seasonal changes and humidity and dry and I mean, you know, we just get it all. And sometimes it can change on a dime. So that's what really blows me away when I hear that guys aren't using uh, moisture meters and things. You, you know, another thing too, it's another meter that's to me is very valuable. And that is uh, uh, a hygrometer just to measure some kind of data logger that you can measure that. And you can, they're pretty cheap and fairly accurate. Um, so I always recommend that they do that. You don't have to spend hundred bucks or 200 bucks I, I tell them to go down to the local box store and grab a meter out of the garden center, a, a hygrometer out of the garden center. And I use a couple of those on the job sites and I, and I cross-reference and measure those against the ones that I use as an inspector. And it's surprising how those things for 12, 15 bucks, how accurate they are. So a guy doesn't have to spend a ton of money to at least have some information that he can give the contractor or the inspector or his homeowner. Talk to his homeowner intelligently about 
the requirements that they're going to have to meet in that on that job site. You know, you said that you, when you have a, the conversation with the guys, usually it's and then it turns into a great conversation of what kind of meter should I get and what have you. I um, mean, hopefully, what we try to accomplish with this show is that they 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 don't you don't have to have that conversations with them. You know what I mean? Right. You know, the liability out there now. I mean, back you know thirty years ago, well, hell, not even you know maybe five years ago, you could get two and a quarter red oak for you know two fifty a square foot or whatever. Right. These floors nowadays, you're looking at, you know, eight, nine, ten bucks and beyond a square foot. It's a lot of liability and investment in that client's home to not do your due diligence, right? It's it's shocking to me. I I, I have a I was I was at a PK not long ago and one of the presenters said he asked you, I said, I'm not trying to be sarcastic about this. He goes, Ray, show of hands, who has enough money in their ATM machine to pay for a hundred thousand dollar failure yeah. and i thought that was a great question and it sounds a little on the sarcastic side but it wasn't meant to be it was genuine and we all have that fear um you know fortunately in my career i haven't had to go to my atm for that but i also was pretty diligent about my approach to it from required site conditions um you know Sometimes you had to walk away from a job because it, they weren't going to give you the conditions that were necessary for a successful hardwood job. Yeah. The only guy I know that has that kind of money in his ATM is Wayne. <laughs> uh, That's what I've heard. Only, yeah, he's the only guy I know who has that kind of money. He's making, he's making all that up, Carl. That's because he's yeah. like, I, I made $600 a year more in a podcast than he did last year. <laughs> 600 boy <laughs> uh, it's the way the title of the show is so <laughs> uh okay moisture meters and, and you know we're going to touch on a lot of subjects because we could do a deep dive in any of uh, any of these just two of these could make the whole show yeah but we don't have that kind of time so uh we'll kind of go down the list okay. uh, acclimation let's talk a little bit about acclimation too critical um and I put there, I, I made a comment about even engineered flooring, because a lot of the manufacturers, they have a specific requirement, how you handle it. They want some, some of them require or say, leave it in the package. Do not take the plastic off, acclimate it to the site conditions, temperature, open the boxes, install the floor. Other ones are different. Um, so what I, what I see is, and this is again critical, is to know your product. If, if you, they say don't open the boxes so you can get to the instructions, everyone has a phone in their pocket. Don Connor years ago said this is the most important piece of equipment in our toolbox today. And he held up the first iPhone I had ever seen. And, it's, and, and that hasn't changed at all. So in my book, there's no reason to not understand the acclimation process or what the manufacturer requires. And I always use, going back to your guys' location, I always use as examples different locations in the United States from I'm, I'm in California. I think Wayne, you're in uh, Tennessee, Rob, you're on the East coast brothers in Michigan. We have installers in Florida, Houston, Hawaii, Montana, all of those, that term acclimation has to, they understand that it's the region. It's not a time frame. It's a moisture balance. And if you take the material out of Montana and ship that to Florida, you have a different acclimation process. So that's what I can I continue to emphasize to these guys that just because we're in California and the material shipped from the warehouse 30 miles south of us doesn't mean it's ready to install on Tuesday if it was delivered on a Monday. So acclimation is critical. It's not a time frame or a date on the calendar. It's a moisture balance in the wood, and you won't know that unless you have a moisture meter. Let's. I want to. So I want to talk about that real quick. Um, you know, I think, uh, and I've seen this in, in my day to day, is that a lot of times I think younger contractors get kind of. Um, I don't want to use the word bullied or or or, or they feel like. Um, they have to do this. They feel pressured to get these things done. They can't say no and blah, blah, blah. But I, I want to say how important that is that you own the business and, and, and you have to be able to stand up for yourself. And to your point of, of uh, some jobs you want to turn down 
because right. they're not they're not right. And if you look at how much liability is out there, the older you get, the more I, I was. I've always said I was motivated by fear. I didn't have the callbacks. It's a good motivation. Yes, I didn't want to have these callbacks, and that's why I did things right because right. I I was afraid that we would get a callback. So for younger guys. Don't feel pressured into a situation, locked into a corner because a general contractor says that this job has to start at a certain time. Right. What's the number you think that guys should be looking at on the balance of subfloor and wood floor? Well, the rule of thumb, you know, we used to use all, it was always based on solid long, you know, when we were still doing mostly unfinished, sanded finish. Um, the numbers that kind of I hear fluctuate from different products is you still want to figure Anything wider, three inches or wider, you if it's a solid floor, you want two percent between subfloor and flooring material. Some companies will allow four percent if it's engineered. Um, I still like two percent all the time, but four percent is pretty good for an engineered product. That seems to be the standard. What everyone says, you know, of all the information and specifications I've read. But but two percent on a solid is the one that sticks in my head. That's sometimes very difficult to get to, especially if the builder's kind of beating you up on time. So when we talk about acclimation, real quick, um, you know, I see a lot of times it's the way it works. Okay, so you're not actually doing the job this week. You're dropping the wood off. Right. So you're in a hurry because you're going to do that. Then you're going to get to your job where you're going to start sanding. So, you know, I see a lot of times the guys come in, they'll take 3,000 square feet and they'll just stack it in one pile up in, in the house. You want to talk about the way that you really, that should be stacked in the house? Well, sometimes there's a limited amount of space. So you may have to have that conversation. If you're not the person doing, uh, maybe making the sale, maybe you're not doing the estimate. So you're not familiar until you get there. But if any time that you can spread that out throughout the rooms and the locations it's going to be installed at. So if you have a living room, dining room, you'd want to divide that material up, put it, you know, whatever that amount's going to be in those rooms, family room, another one. Back in the bedrooms, if you can't get them into the bedroom, try to get them as close to that part of the house as it's going to be. If there's an upstairs, upstairs has a different climate than downstairs a lot of times, get the material upstairs. Um, I always like to, if you don't have enough space to stick or stack them, site, you know, a little, um, at least have space between your rows. If you stack them three row, three cartons high, make sure there's air space between them. Um, always recommend a sticker to be underneath them between them, the subfloor, especially if it's concrete, but even on plywood, get some air, make sure there's air underneath there. But what's critical too, on acclimation is to find out what the manufacturer wants you to do with that material. Like I say, some of them say, leave it in the plastic. Some of them say, open the cartons. Some of them say, just cut the tips open. So you have to know what that manufacturer wants you to do with that. Um, so I watch all these videos. Now we're gonna move on to installation a little bit. I watch all these videos and every video now is a race. Ba -da 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 you know, uh, 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 you know, nailing three quarter inch TNG ninety miles an hour, boom, 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 as fast as you can. So you want to talk about also the nailing schedule and that that type of stuff, uh, uh, which you know goes on to loose floors and noisy floors and all that kind of maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that I see pretty repetitive, and that is, um, I think they think because the noise, the the Fastener makes a big loud noise when you hit it, whether it's a small uh, quarter inch crown staple or, or the three quarter inch cleat or uh, a staple. You think that that machine might have enough power to hold that or when you hit it, it's going to pull that thing down nice and tight against the subfloor. So we see a lot of that where um, there's a term out there that's called fiber blowout or uh, grain blowout where as the cleat goes through the bottom, it blows a little bit of fiber out of the, on the bottom side of that plank. If you get a little bit of that, a lot of times that board's not gonna be flat on the subfloor. So we get a little squeak on those. Um, fastener schedule is really important as far as the distance between them, you know, four to six, six to eight, eight to 10, those kind of things, know what that is, what those requirements are. Um, air compressors adjusted properly. Generally you have a tank pressure and then you have a line pressure. That's really important because you, you might think you're setting the, the staple or the cleat properly and maybe it's going in too far 
or maybe it's not going far enough. And then again, you're going to get a squeaky floor or possible squeaky floor. Um, on the pre-finish side of it, it's not so much, it's not quite as critical on the sand and finish because you get a little bit more putty work on that, but I still don't recommend it. And that is on the pre-finish where the guys are using the rubber mallets and they're hitting the surface of the planks or they're hitting the, I call it the leading edge and they're pounding and, and just literally driving the mallet along that edge. And they think that big rubber mallet is soft enough that that wood's gonna take that impact. And the amount of um, edge fracturing that we see sometimes six weeks, two months, three months down the road where they, you can actually see the impact. You can see the edge of it compressed a little bit, but you don't pick up on that right away until people start living on it. Maybe they do a little maintenance, they get a little liquid down in there and that starts to splinter. So I would always say, use your tapping block if you have it. Don't hit, if you don't have one, make one out of a piece of scrap material. So your, your mallet and your hammer is not coming in contact with that flooring and, and just, don't think of it as indestructive because you can do some damage that will not show up and, and everyone thinks that we won't recognize that, but I've seen enough of it, I would recognize it immediately. So be careful with the floor, install it, use the proper tools. If you're doing a, a glue down on concrete where you can't put a fastener in there, use strap clamps. Do not slam that stuff together. Do not beat on that wood. Strap clamps, pull it nice and tight together. Use your tapping block to set that, bring that together, and, and you really shouldn't have any issues. When you do inspections, what's the percent of inspections that you've done that the nailing pattern was wrong? Rob, I don't have a number, but just as a kind of off the top of my head, I would say probably 25, 30%. And some of them, the one that you see, it's shocking that you just go, did someone run out of nails? Did they lose track of where they were? I mean, we've seen them where, you know, a, a four foot plank will have three staples in it or three cleats in it. And you think, oh, that's kind of a throwaway. It's kind of, and then you start checking the floor and think this is the pattern. Well, that wasn't Wayne's brother's fault. That was, that was Wayne. I, mean, <laughs> I know Wayne's brother. Wayne, Wayne pushes <laughs> those <was>. guys. <laughs> Wayne pushed those guys too hard, and they just had to come up with shortcuts somehow. His and, his tool his tool was the whip instead of a come on. Yeah, guys. <laughs> he was yelling at him too at the cost of the nails. You know, you know what that's yeah. costing me. Yeah, that's very interesting that you could that 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 doesn't show itself the uh, the edge fracturing what have you until down the road that would shock some people to, to know that I think. And how much is this related to speed, you know, I think so much of these guys are humping man and, and a lot of times guys right, their, right. their pride is how much I can get done in a day. Right, right. You know, like that's that's the, the I think we get wrapped up in that too much sometimes and I get it we you know we get paid by the square foot a lot of times and right. I understand that and the labor shortage, I get all that. But that that speed sometimes can really come back to bite you. And and that comes to stair steps and all that kind of stuff, right? Right, right. So so what I find is generally the impact damage, and that's what I call it, um, it's gonna be more pronounced on a on a glued floor because the glue I see that that seems to be the pattern because the adhesive has a lot of strength to it. So if they're, let's say they, they're, they're used to installing an unfinished floor or, or they're just going to staple the floor down, you're like, little, kind, of, kind of tap those boards together because there's nothing resisting them. There's no glue in the way. So you can kind of tap those edges, no damage. It's when you start getting into the really wide planks, the six, seven, nine, now we're at 10 inches and greater, and they put a band of glue down, they put that glue down, there's a whole lot of strength that that adhesive is trying to hold that plank in place. And that's when the damage, when they really start pounding on those boards, really start pounding on them. So that's where my recommendation, and I don't know how many strap clamps have been purchased since I've been trying to describe the importance of them. But to use a strap clamp on that, pull tension on those planks, and then tap them with the tapping block, it's just incredible how it just cinches that thing in. There's no damage done. You just move across the floor. Yeah. But to your point, Wayne, they have a tendency to think that it slows them down and it really doesn't. It really doesn't slow the strap clamps. 
I was making a comparison like this. Some guy said, well, I'd rather use blue tape. Well, as I'm going across the floor using the strap clamps, once I'm finished, you now have to come back and remove all the tape. I don't have to do, do yeah. that. So it's point. kind of a, this, it's trade, it's a little bit of a trade off. Yeah. Uh, well, it was staying with glue downs also. Um, I mean, there's going to be hollow spots. There can be, you know, sometimes guys will um, outlay the uh, open time on, on, a, on a floor, which can lead to hollow spots and other issues and not waiting the boxes down. So maybe uh, as particularly with glue downs and that type of stuff, we can maybe go into that a little bit using the proper trowel. So maybe it, it would, you can kind of talk about that a little bit. Well, I would say I would start off with floor flatness. I hear it a lot. Um, the guys say, well, I just put a little more adhesive in the low spots and it kind of fills them up and that works pretty good most of the time, which you're not going to get an argument out of me. That might be the case, but floor flatness is critical. And that three sixteenths and 10 feet or eight inch and six feet, if you could get within those tolerances, you, the chances of having a hollow spot are, are, have, are been reduced greatly. Um, so that's where I always, I always say start there. Know what size trowel you're, you're supposed to use. Know what your open time is. Um, I always recommend to hold it to with maybe two rows of the adhesive, depending on the length of the room. If you've got a 30-foot room, don't spread like you think you're going to get four or five rows in there. By the time you get out there, you're, you're almost cured by the time you get out to that last row. It's not going to go together, and then it's not going to grab the wood properly. You're going to have a hollow spot, those kind of things. So... Know what your rate is, know what your set time is. When it comes to subfloor prep, uh, it's been my experience that a lot of times a guy will uh, come out and bid the job and go, okay, I'm just going to throw a number out there. We're going to install this for, for 12 bucks a square foot, whatever. GC says, fine, that's great. Then the day of the job, the time to do the job, the floor guy gets there and really starts looking at the, the highs and lows. And, and it's like, well, we didn't charge for subfloor prep. And a GC said, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, whatever. And now that, now it's a tougher conversation, right? Right. Difficult uh, conversation. Yes. To, to not have that up front. So. It, it the, the GCs to me, and unfortunately, and I've worked with quite a few good ones over the years. What I, what I'm recognizing and you guys might too, being in the business as long as you have, they're kind of taken over our industry as far as our schedule goes. Uh, and the demands they're putting on us. And I read an article recently, and they talk about the cost of money to build a home or or construction loan, how critical it is to get that house done as soon as possible. And, and I think also with the with the advancements in pre-finished flooring, they're treating our trade a little bit differently. And they're thinking, hey, we can just put this floor down and cover it up, or we can just go ahead and put it in, even if we're not quite ready for it. So going back to your statement earlier about the younger guys not having the experience to talk to a general contractor and say, this is the important thing for us. We need subfloor flatness. We need a good site conditions. Uh, we can't over overspray. We can't have high spots. And we need to be paid to, to, to take care of them. That's a hard conversation for a young guy. It, it is. And, um, um, you know, nobody's going to come back. Everybody has amnesia uh, after the fact. And those conversations, uh, you're the guy holding the bag. There's nobody, there's no cavalry coming and it's, it's, it's on you to, to do that. And man, I just think some of the, so you, I think the fear sometimes if I don't do the job, somebody else will. Someone else will. And um, a lot of guys will go through their entire career with that. Uh, it says a lot about the self-confidence of a, a real craftsman that can say, you know what? Uh, and, and that's what I loved about going to the NWFA school, by the way, is that, you're out there as a flooring contractor on an island sometimes. Like you're out there facing these general contractors, boom, 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 one at a time that are putting these demands on you. And you're, you're telling them, look, here's what needs to be done. But then you go to the school like this, like, the, like this inspector school, or you go to the NWA class, you realize, look, this isn't me saying this. There's a body of science behind this. Absolutely. And I know what I'm talking about, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold, my, you know, hold my position here. And uh, the, the good contractors, you'll see again. Uh, the bad ones, you didn't want them anyhow. Right. Uh, and and the, the way things have been in the last few years, I know it's slowing down in parts of the country now, but you can really, especially the crime of it is, is getting yourself in that situation when there's so much work out there. You know what I mean? Where you put yourself behind the eight ball to begin with, so. Well, you know, um, 
talk, speaking about the NWFA, the one thing that's interesting is how many uh, uh, mills and manufacturers reference the NWFA as their standards. So again, if the foreign contractor would take advantage of that and say, this is not my word, this is not what I require, this is what not just the manufacturer, it's the best practices of the industry. Mm -hmm. and and have that information so that if he wants to counter you you can give him that information going back to the cell phone here let me pull it up i'll send you some emails yeah um yeah so the more information the general car the contractors have to give to the general the better off they are the safer they are and it always safer. sounds better coming from a third party it it does it does it's correct I, well, you, you know what, Rob, that's another, you know, the position I'm in now, I can't tell you how many times that happens. Hey, can I conference you in? I would need you to talk to my general contractor, or can you talk with my homeowner and, and back them up? Right. When I was still contracting and still installing stuff, I, that was one of the lines that I would use with a homeowner is I go by the standards and practices of the National Wood Floor Association. Yeah. They're yeah. the governing body. They're the ones who set the rules not me not the manufacturer you know this is why i go by their standards well i think wayne hit a great word it's the science we have science behind us just just as a painting contractor has just as a cement contractor that guy's not going to pour slab if the dew points off he's not going to pour slab if it's raining so why can't the flooring guys be able to use the science as well uh yeah. rain wayne will do it <laughs> he, he, he's the guy who squirts water on it to make it ooze out e easier. Oh, Ooze so he puts the water on it, throws the Tramex down. Yeah. And go, oh, it's too wet. I can't work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I got to go fishing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He does know you. I yeah. do. <laughs> um, no, all, all, all really good points. And, you know, sometimes, and to your point about a third party, I've been called out in, in my role as a ter territory manager years ago. I get called out to jobs sometimes and um to talk to the homeowner and i would basically tell the homeowner the same thing the contractor told them and because it came from me they would believe me and i would be mad on on the contractor's behalf yeah you, you this guy told you, you hired a professional and he told you 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 don't even know me yeah I, you know what i mean and you should you trust this guy's word and sometimes on their behalf i get frustrated because like and i know he does too like yeah you didn't need me you told her exactly the right thing to do and yeah and she had to hear it from somebody else and I'm sorry that that was the case. Yeah, it, it, it's. I think that's just kind of the the nature of the public. They they just yeah. for some reason. Um, and then let's talk about sanding. And I think this is one of the, hold, the toughest things. Hold too. on one Wait. minute before we get into sanding. I I, I just want to, and I know you're going to kill me for this, but you know that's that's why we do the show, <laughs> right? There was a like I said when I was reading some of your notes and. Uh, you know, maybe in California, it's not as important as it is out in the east or where your brother is up in Michigan. But I'd like you to touch a little bit on occupancy ready when okay. you're doing the acclimation. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I use that term a lot. I use occupancy ready and I, and, I, and I don't hold that just to someone's home. It's the building as well. Occupancy ready. If And I always say. A little on the sarcastic side, but I don't mean to be. I try to make a point as if you were standing outside the door with your suitcases and you were going to sleep there that night. And that's occupancy ready prior to delivery of material, not after it gets there or before you start installation. It's prior to. So so to me, occupancy ready is what would be comfortable to virtually anybody that we know as family or friends. They're not going to move into a house that's a hundred and six degrees outside and 85 inside they're not going to move in there if it's 50 degrees in the house they're not going to sleep there so occupancy ready is the hvac has been set it's running humidity is controlled the temperatures are right to receive our material so that that material is acclimating to its lip the, the environment it's going to live in from that point on that's that's my definition of occupancy ready it's what the room you're sitting in right now is occupancy ready. It's established, it's comfortable, it it stays fairly stable throughout the entire year. Even with the huge changes you guys deal with, it's still pretty stable. So your material 
climatizes and lives in that environment. You take it down the street, might be a different occupancy ready for those residents down there or that business. Because I know there's so many deliveries going on where it's not. I, I love what you said about, no, don't, you might be getting it ready. Right. But you want it completely ready before we put a stick on that job. I actually was at a site last just last Friday and um, a very high end mill, well known, well established, been around forever, very high standards. And um, I was called out because they were having trouble. They, they wouldn't believe the flooring guy. And I walked in the house, it was 61 degrees in the house. Was, and, and this is a building that's being converted. It's a condominium that's being worked on. It's a probably a 25 year old building. So it's been around, it's not brand new construction, but the inside is brand new construction. And they looked at me like I had three heads when I said, this material technically should be taken out of the building. Fire up the HVAC, get this occupancy ready and then bring it back in. And they said, what do you, and so we explained occupancy ready to them. Now this is a flooring guy going back to our earlier conversation that was bending to the will of the contract. You know, I was in New York not too long ago, and uh, I was talking to a guy who's on a on a, a huge job, and it's a it's a massive building, and um, he said, you know, the interest rates went up, and so what it does to that that general contractor's what it does the how much he pays every month on that on his loan and whatever is astro astronomical, so he's speeding up the process for everybody. Right. And the problem is we get caught up in that vortex. Yeah. Sometimes. And, uh, and, and like you said, bending to the will, uh, I, I like that phrase because that's what happens. I, I just think it's so important that we, um, you know, like, like I say, we're doing this because you want to keep people out of trouble. You get no satisfaction. I know, uh, going in these situations where it goes against the contractor. Yeah. You, you, it just not, not anybody. It doesn't, it doesn't help anybody in this industry if, if that being the case. So hopefully we can, um, especially the younger guys that are coming up that maybe don't have as much experience in the industry that kind of keep them out of trouble. So uh, that's why I, I, I'm thrilled you making the time to be on. Well, you know, I have, I do have access to where my office is. Um, I'm in one of our branches. And uh, so I do have access and a lot of guys have access to me. And I just tell them, I'm, and I mean it sincerely, do not ever hesitate to send me a text or a photograph or a phone call. I may not get the phone call, but if you if you say, hey, can you evaluate this? We might be able to help you out and prevent that from happening. So always make we always I always try to. And they're they're young guys, and I'm trying to take advantage of the years of experience and the anguish that I've gone through. Yeah. Standing that, looking at that builder, thinking, if he tells me to get off this job, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Yeah. You know, so it's like help give him the language to be able to use with the contractor and the homeowner. Yeah, good, 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 good call. All right. Do you want to move on to sanding a little bit, or do we want to touch anything more on the um, on the installation part? Um, I, I the sanding seems to be the most subjective to me, to, to toughest to do an inspection on, um, and I, just from my my opinion, I mean, um, of what is passable and what's not passable and what have you. Um, certainly, the techniques have gotten better in, in, in the recent years. Machinery's gotten better. Milling's gotten better. Um, there's a lot more information out there than ever has been. Uh, clients are also more educated than they ever have been, in the, and which also creates some, some when, they, when they think they know more than the floor guy does on day two of the job. So maybe I talk about YouTube. <laughs> yes, I saw it on YouTube. So, yeah. <laughs> I'd um, have done it myself if I had the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what are some things that you see on sand jobs that get gets, gets guys in trouble? Um, I would say probably the, the two easiest ones to spot are uh, jumping sequence, where maybe it's a new installation um, and they go after it. I used to use I used to use uh, 40, 80, 100 sequence, um, depending on what the what kind of wood it was, things like that, if it was a fresh install. Um, but I've seen as coarse as a 36 grid and jump to 100. Yeah. You know, st stuff like that. I mean, that that's kind of a outlier but you still see that a lot um it, or or you will see them maybe making their first cut at that angle and then they don't sand when they when they change that direction they don't 
stay on it enough to make sure all of those side cuts that that flattening cut are taken out um but generally depending if they here's here's what i what i have found over the years if you don't know what color the stain is going to be a lot of times the guys will sand a certain way if they think it's going to be a clear finish or natural finish not going to show quite as much you maybe not going to see a scratch or something but then all of a sudden they have to stain the floor and then that, and then they're in trouble. So that's when you start seeing those sander marks. Um, not taking enough time to make sure the floor is flat. And it looks flat when it's dull, doesn't have any sheen on it. And then you put that stain on there or you put that first coat of finish and every single imperfection is going to show. Everyone. Um, the, the word subjective is kind of tough because I think if you – know how to sand a floor and you've looked at a sand properly sanded and stained and finished floor it's an easy thing to pick up and i try not to be too critical but if you're called out and they're asking you you're you've got to give you've got to say that kind of thing gotcha um and i i too especially when we went to wider plank floors uh when i see sometimes the butt joints are kind of rolled where the yeah. guy went went straight on every pass, yeah. and he didn't, you know, he didn't go at an angle where you can see that that the, the butt joints are more pronounced, or they're, they're, you know, what I mean, they have like a roll to them, or, or you can see where they're like there's a dip that you you wouldn't see until you get like the stain or finish on them. I I see that quite common, um, as, um so I see that a lot. Uh, you uh, dish out in waves. Um, you still, you still just out of curiosity, how many guys are still running drum sanders in your area? It's shocking. <laughs> it's shocking. It's shocking how much um, chatter you still see. Yeah. Yeah, you still see those undulation marks. Uh, not as many as it was, say, 20 years ago. Because as the machines break down, they go, look, if I'm going to spend $3,000 to repair this one, I'm going to put that towards a belt sander. So, um, you, know, I, you know, just to try to prevent some of that stuff, if the guys are still using, this is what we used to do when we got, when we started and it, in those days, eight inch was a pretty wide plank. It was four, six, and eight kind of stuff. But that wide plank created a problem. So what we did, if we saw a little bit too much overwood, we would feather those edges down with a with an edger before we fired up the sander. So you didn't have that that drop off. You didn't have that trying to climb over the top. So we kind of smoothed those areas before we started our first cut. Little yeah. trick, and yeah. it and it and it made a difference. Yeah, for sure. And you're right. Back in those days, I mean, eight inch was a wide man. The four six oh, huge. Uh, was wide, <laughs> like the width of a tree. It's like well, we're putting trees in today. But now, yeah. nowadays, I mean, eight inches uh, is a yeah. mini. Well, we're 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 asking a lot out of our our products today than than we ever have before. We're putting them down faster, and right. and we're um, we're going wider and wider, and we're putting them in places we wouldn't have put them in years and years ago. So we are putting a lot of demands and sometimes we take for granted what the capabilities of these products will do. So I think as you know, there's been a lot of advances in technology for sure that's helped us. Just out of curiosity, let me ask you this. I always like like uh, asking a guy who's been around for a long time. Do you think it's tougher to do floors today or it's tougher to do floors 30 years ago? Um, the last floor I did was about six years ago and I was with my son and I'll tell you, be honest with you, it's just, it's easier today. It's easier today. Yeah, we have we have better adhesives. Um, we're not trying to go over a one by six stuck for a floor on a forty five degree angle. Um, the fasteners are better. The sanding equipment certainly is better. The formulations of the stains and the finishes today are better. I mean, I, I I've been we, we you've all been in to go from the oil industry oil finish to this, the water-based finishes, that was a little bit of a, a, a learning curve. And it was probably about a, to me, was about a three-year learning curve. And then to get the stains and everything compatible again. But when I think about those two different, just those two different parts of our industry, um, the, the water-based finishes are so much better. They're prettier, they're easier, they're cleaner, they're less harmful to us. The stains are better, um, the fasteners are better, the compressors, the portable sanders. Now we have battery operated saws and chop saws and 
crazy things that just make everything so much easier. I, I honestly think I am not one of those. Uh, it's better in the old days. I, I, I believe today the, the industry is in a really good place and the young guys coming in are in a really good place. I, I really agree with you with the milling and the wide con the, the open concept rooms where you can make time now they're not bordering every every you know oh. uh, you know you remember in the old days like if you worked in San Francisco you had a hallway going 40 feet long but, but the wrong direction sideways all you had was an edger to, to make that flat and uh it's just gotten it's, it's a little I, yeah. I think the uh some of the challenges we didn't have to face though were social media uh, you know, which can, you know, can be challenging as well for the, for the guys today, though, I think for sure. Uh, when you asked him that question, my thought was, I think the equipment has made things easier, but the customers are tougher. You, well, you know, as, as you were getting ready to say that, Rob, the one thing that I was going to say about the fact that we have new equipment that makes our job easier, it doesn't change the science that we have to use on the wider plank because i re i truly believe if we continue on with the information that we have whether it's a 10 inch wide plank and you still have occupancy ready and we still take the same approach that we're not we're not in a nascar race we're trying to put in a product and get it in and give it a 50 60 70 year life so if we take advantage of all the new tools and all the better equipment that we have and 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 products but still take the acclimation, the occupancy ready, proper nailing schedule, proper sanding. We can turn out a product that is just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you used to say, you know, this isn't a tabletop, but man, you can, with the, today's equipment, you go back and look at floor jobs you did 30 years ago that you thought were lights out, and they were. <laughs> and at the time, today, yeah. you yeah. can produce a better floor. W without question, without question. This is in the part one of two-part episode we have with Carl Manningly. So please stay tuned to next week. We're going to have part two. This has been another episode of On the Floor with Wayne and Rob and Carl Manningly. Please stay tuned for another episode. <laughs>